You know, it, it really is, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to talk about sustainability, particularly what it is the cities can do around sustainability. Sustainability is, is one of these words, it's a, it's a remarkable thing. It, it has come to mean so much and at the same time, uh, nothing at all. You know, it could mean it, it's become one of these simple buzzwords. Right? So when we talk about sustainability, we could be talking about uh, sustainable technologies, technologies that allow us to reduce our carbon emissions, things like solar panels. We won't be discussing that uh, kind of thing tonight, although I will mention that um, I'll be installing the first solar panels uh, on city-owned properties later this year on our fire department, our youth bureau, and hopefully even our, our city hall. Uh, but when I talk about sustainability as it relates to the city, I really want to focus on, on uh, three things. Uh, environmental sustainability, sure, uh, particularly when it comes to land use. Uh, economic sustainability, right, when it comes to the sustainability of our government and the sustainability of each household. Uh, and I want to talk uh, about uh, cultural sustainability that's a, a, a bit harder to quantify, right, a bit harder to talk about. And I want to do all that in about 30 minutes. Uh, and, then we'll, uh, and then we'll take questions. I, I want to thank, too, the, we've got a, a representative from Mayor Landry's office here. Um, Mr. Diaz, are you? Yes, from the, uh, the, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Engagement, uh, a terrific initiative uh, that I've just been extremely impressed by. And uh, I had a chance to meet uh, Mr. Diaz and, and Mr. Landrieu earlier today, uh, which was quite a trip. You guys have quite the mayor down here. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, he's a, he's a character the first time. I actually met him in D.C. at the White House. There was a group of us mayors who were invited to have lunch, about six of us. And uh, when I walked in, he looked at me and he said, who are you? You know, like that. And I said, I'm the mayor of Ithaca. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm the mayor of Ithaca. And he said, huh? <laughs> I was like, I'm the, uh, I'm the mayor of Ithaca. He said, what? And I said, I'm the mayor of, I, I don't know, maybe he was slow. I said, I'm the, I'm the mayor, so I spoke more, I'm the mayor of Ithaca, New York. And then he said the question, he said, how? Right? Which is sort of what I think a lot of folks want to know, how? And, and how does somebody uh, get elected at 24? And the truth is, I was elected with a broad coalition of support. I ended up winning uh, all 18 out of 18 election districts. We had five people in our race, mayoral race. I won with 55% of the vote. Uh, so I explained that to him, and he seemed very bored. But we, <laughs> he said, the real question is, why would somebody your age think they could or should run for mayor? And this is actually, this is a very important question to me. Uh, and to answer it, you may need to know a bit about where I came from. And I think hopefully that will inform <laughs> the rest of this talk tonight. I was born uh, into poverty and homelessness. My, my mother raised the four of us kids under some very difficult circumstances. Um, we, were, we were just, frankly, we were just very poor. And at times we lived in, in our car or in homeless shelters. And she worked extremely hard, three jobs my whole life, to get not just me, but all four of us to college. You know? And by the time you get in 18 years from where I started to uh, a school like Cornell University, you, you, you truly begin to believe that anything is possible. So with that delusion in mind, uh, <laughs> when I was 20 years old, I was what you, <coughs> you would call, or I would call, uh, an activist, an advocate. Uh, this is what people inside City Hall call uh, a pain in the ass, I believe, <laughs> is a literal. Uh, the, the direct translation, uh, I think it's Latin. And, uh, w w you know, I spent a lot of time saying, this is what you should do. This is how you should vote. This is what the government should do. Uh, and after a while, you know, you, you start thinking, instead of telling these people how to vote, maybe I should just get out and vote. And get out and vote. And that's what I did. I ran my junior year, was elected to the city council, served for four years, and last year I decided to run. 
And one of the reasons I decided to run was because I was convinced that we were not going in the direction that we needed to, particularly when it came to land use. This was uh, an issue uh, that I thought touched at the heart of everything in our city, but only got um, discussed in a reactive way, right? How was each particular project going to impact the neighbors that were around it, right? We never took a step back and looked at the grand vision. We never looked at the direction that we were going in. And because we never looked at that direction, I believe that we were going in the wrong direction. Now, we've done some things to fix it, and I'll talk about those first. <coughs> but first, I want to uh, I, I explain, for anybody who doesn't know, smart growth. How many folks are familiar with this term? Oh, uh, quite a few, right? So you can describe smart growth, uh, in essence, by describing what it's not. So sprawl, how many people are familiar with sprawl? Right? Where land use, development of housing, development of of commercial space development of office space is allowed to just run uh, to the outskirts of a city and beyond into, uh, until you get sprawling suburbs, strip malls. You know how sometimes when you go to, no matter what city you're in, uh, if you, you can find the one quarter that'll make you feel like you're in any city in America? You know what I'm talking about? The Lowe's next to Home Depot. You know what I'm talking about? Walmart next to Kmart. The whole nine yards. The, the McDonald's next to Burger King. And that has a whole host of negative uh, effects, which we'll get into. But what smart growth does is say, and you know what, we're going to restrict where growth can go. It can't just uh, extend, it can't just sprawl as far as it wants to. We're going to make sure that the growth of housing, the growth of commercial space, the growth of, of office space is going to be concentrated in, in these population centers, these dense population centers, right, where uh, we already have transit available where there's already employment opportunities available, and where the stress and the strain on the city services is the least. Now, <laughs> I was convinced that we had to do this. And this is an idea that while it's been embraced by developers, and it's been embraced by the environmentalist crowd, and it's been embraced in many ways by urbanists and urban planners, uh, does have um, its critics. You know, a, a council person, somebody who's on the city council with me in Ithaca, He's got his PhD in, in literature, uh, so um, so he's uh, what's the word? So he's annoying, right? <laughs> no, Seth. He's actually very he's actually a very good friend, and uh, he worked to help get me elected. I worked to help uh, get him elected, uh, but he he has coined a term called uh, density and its discontents, right? Density has all sorts of great things going forward. It increases the tax base, right? It allows uh, people to walk to work. It allows people to bike to work. It leads to healthier lifestyles. It promotes local businesses and small businesses. But uh, it also can lead to, because you're localizing all of the negative externalities of our everyday human American life, uh, you are pushing people closer together. Sometimes you have to listen to your neighbors argue through your walls. Sometimes there's litter in the streets. Sometimes there are car horns honking. Sometimes there's air pollution, noise pollution, light pollution. These are the negative externalities that have to be overcome if you're going to build a dense city that's livable and it's enjoyable to live with. Right? So you really have to prove to people, show to people, that you can densify your city, that you can use smart growth to make the city a better place without sacrificing the quality of life. And in order to do that, you really have to, to show them the little things. And you have to take care of the little things. And that's uh, what we focused on here. <laughs> One of the things I've tried to do is use uh, uh, creative techniques to show people that uh, none of the changes that are happening to our city are outside of our control, and that, that in everything our government does, we want to hear from them. So uh, <coughs> outside of my office, I installed the mayor's listening post. Now, I know what you're thinking. How many, how many students do we have here? So you're thinking, what is that thing? <laughs> I mean, it's like Facebook but in like real life, right? <laughs> so instead of writing me a Facebook message, you can put something in here, uh, which is really nice. Another thing we've done, anybody recognize these? Do you know what this is? You may not even, you'd be surprised. Does anybody recognize, uh, even recognize? These are on almost every block, and I've made sure as we were driving around, these are all over New Orleans. They're electrical boxes. They're used by the utility companies uh, to control the traffic lights and the street lights. They're everywhere, they're nondescript, the gray. On your drive home, take a look. You'll spot some. Uh, you may also see some graffiti on it. We have them everywhere. And we thought, you know, as we're getting more people closer together, and, you, and, and, and as you're building, and as you create these sorts of spaces, these are spaces that don't exist in suburban environments. These are uh, the kind of 
uh, of negative externalities that folks in urban environments learn to live with, to walk around, to not notice, and to not notice if it's spray painted. Right? We thought, well, what if we could take away that negative externality? We created the 21 Boxes Project. So 21 boxes throughout the city. I put out a call for artists. We got 40 artists back. We chose the 21 uh, that we thought had the best project idea, and we allowed them to do whatever it is they wanted to do on the boxes. We turned these everyday utilities, uh, you honestly couldn't get any more boring, into works of art. Right? And not everybody likes them. <laughs> it's kind of the fun of art, though. That's what I tell people when they call my office. <laughs> They'll say, I hate that one in the corner of Buffalo and whatever. And I say, yeah, me too. <laughs> isn't, isn't that great? <laughs> you know, uh, not everybody buys it. But this is the kind of thing, you, not only did we uh, beautify an urban landscape, but we involved the community when we did it. We, got, we didn't just commission them ourselves, right? And we didn't just go out and paint them into what we thought were going to be pretty colors. We found artists that we thought could, uh, uh, could help us out. This is an example of a little thing. A little thing that will help us accomplish the large things that we need to do. Another example is the fireworks. I was glad that Michelle mentioned this. Seems, like a, seems trivial. This is a, an actual picture of the fireworks over our, our lake, and that's Cornell University up there uh, on the hill. Uh, we had not had fireworks in the city for, for quite some time. And uh, I am, I'm younger than your average mayor. Right? So I, I take great pains, typically, to maintain my cool, my calm. I have to look older all the time. You keep the tie on. I sleep in the tie. You know, to make sure everybody, <laughs> to make sure everything, because you never, they can't catch you, you know. Uh, so I, I woke up uh, about three weeks before the 4th of July. And uh, for a moment, I lost my mayoral composure. I, I throw... What, what scientists call uh, a hissy fit, you know, or uh, a temper tantrum. I said, we are having fireworks. We're going to do them on the lake. And I don't know how we're going to pay for them, but we're going to pay for them. So I put that on Facebook. I said, we have three weeks to raise $15,000. If you can send in $10, let us know, and we can do fireworks. In four days, we'd raise $30,000. Right? In four days. Right? From people and the stories that were attached to these really showed me that we were doing the right thing. In a, in a city and in a neighborhood in which people become increasingly segregated, and this has been happening, uh, I'm not talking just about racial segregation, although that is a factor. I'm talking about class segregation, in which people in the automobile has allowed this to happen. People can choose where they want to live with ease, and they can choose to exit uh, communities in which they don't want to be a part it is possible for you to live in a city and never take part in an event in which truly everyone is represented. On this night, 17,000 people, we're a city of 30,000, 17,000 people crowded into our three parks to watch these fireworks. It was free, so it didn't matter how much money you had. You didn't have to pay to get in. And for one night, that sky belonged to all of us. We could all look up at it together. Those are the kind of gestures that make people believe when you tell them as a government the approach that we're taking to the development of our city is going to make our lives better. It's these little things that give them the trust they need to have in you to believe you. This. I, this is me kicking a field goal uh, for, for a homecoming rally that Cornell had a couple months ago. This is not relevant to our talk, but I made it, so I wanted to show... <laughs> Pretty good. It was raining. <laughs> this is my parking space. What used to be my parking space. <laughs> Constituent staff just shot of me working on a Sunday. You see, I wasn't wearing a tie. Uh, this is a good way, actually, for me to not get noticed. Folks assume I'm a college student. Working in what used to be the, the mayor's parking space now, two years ago, uh, because I am what we in Ithaca call Earth conscious, but what I understand the rest of the world calls uh, hippies. Uh, I decided to sell my car. And I, I, I sold my car, and now everywhere I go, I either walk or I take the bus. Right? Sometimes I'll ride my bike. And when I got elected, I had this nice reserve for mayor parking space right in the middle, and I didn't, you know, right in front. Didn't know what I was going to do with it. 
Um, so I said, you know what? We have a couple extra benches sitting around we're not doing anything with. We've got an old tree that has to come down. Could we, could we hollow it out? And besides the staff time to bring this here and the sign that costs $45 to fabricate that says, and friends, right? We were able to make <coughs> what became the newest parking space in the city. And all the time now, people stop by. Even when I'm not there, this is the beauty of Facebook. I can't tell you how many pictures I get tagged in. <laughs> I'm not even there. Old people and young people. More young people. This, this project, you know, uh, be became a destination. It, it changed not just my parking space, but it changed the way people viewed public space. They thought uh, identification of the city means a loss of green space, right? It means a loss of, of the sort of vibrancy, but not necessarily, right? There is space all around us, and if we rethink the way we've been using our space, particularly, uh, the alarming amount of space that we give over just to automobiles. I uh, think of this as a thought experiment. Sometime during the day, um, go to a parking garage, and imagine that you're an alien, right? Uh, imagine that you've never seen, um, you've never ever seen uh, people before, you don't know what's going on. You would think that these animals, our cars, are the most important things to us because we give them such prime real estate and we just let them sit there for eight hours a day. They don't have to move, they don't have to do anything, they just sit there for eight hours a day. Space that would be valuable has now been taken over. It's actually even become a place, uh, this is, yeah, this is fun. Anybody know what this is? Stanley the Stanley Cup. The Stanley Cup. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, I was wondering. Uh, that's Dustin Brown. He's the captain of the LA Kings. It's become a place where people gather when there's something to celebrate. It's become, much to my chagrin, a place for people to gather when there's something to protest. This is one week after I installed this thing. I was, people are going to love it. People are going to love me. I have such a great idea. Uh, I did something some folks didn't like, and a week later, this is my reward. What are you going to do? It's even a place where Michelle stopped by one day. <laughs> and I found that, so I wanted to, to, to share that. Those are the sorts of little things that will allow you to get the big things accomplished. And, and so far in Ithaca, we, we have done some fairly large things. We've cleared some obstacles out of our way so we can focus and pivot now towards uh, what is really going to be a focus of the rest of my administration, completing a comprehensive plan that'll get us on the way to the smart growth goals that, that we want. Uh, what we did, actually, in, in our first year, we mentioned the budget, uh, inheriting, to put this in context, uh, um, a $3 million deficit in a city our size. Small city, a budget of about $60 million. City of our size, to close that deficit would have required a 15% tax increase across the board for every property owner. It was unacceptable. But to do it directly through spending cuts would have required a 10% reduction in our personnel. This is the staff of 450 employees we have working in the city. I knew that was unacceptable too, so we, did, we used every tool in our tool book, right? Merging departments and, uh, and streamlining things. Actually refinancing our debt, right? Uh, changing so many of our processes that we were able to reduce, close, completely close this $3 million deficit uh, with a tax increase, not a 15%, but of 2.5%, right? the lowest in 13 years. And how were we able to do that? It required trust from the residents, the people of our city that we knew what we were doing, and we established that trust by doing the little things, by showing that we could pull off the little things. They said, you know what? We trust this administration, we trust those, the staff in the city uh, to know what they're doing. Another thing we did uh, was some governmental reform. Now, uh, I've been in the job 11 months now, and if there's anything I've learned, uh, it's that the best way to lose an audience is to start talking about governmental reform. So I'm not going to. But trust me, we did some cool stuff. And then the Commons reconstruction. What you see here is me with uh, Senator Gillibrand, uh, our senator, uh, in, in the great state of New York, taking a tour of our downtown pedestrian mall. Uh, our downtown pedestrian mall, we call it the Commons. This is something we did. We closed down two blocks, three blocks, of our downtown in the early 70s. Because in the early 70s, the malls were coming in. Right? And they were threatening our, our typical, everywhere across the country, they were threatening the mom and pop stores and the traditional urban cores right? by building cheaply, out where the land is cheap. Uh, they can build all the square footage that they can then put, uh, sell their wares from. Right? Why is that a problem, by the way? It's a problem because the people who own the shops that are in the mall don't live in the community. So while they may pay property taxes, 
any profit that they make off those businesses goes elsewhere, which means uh, it doesn't go into hiring more people uh, in Ithaca, New York. It doesn't go into uh, spending money at restaurants, spending money out at bars, shopping in Ithaca, New York. Right? It doesn't get reinvested here in this community. So every time something is purchased from one of those chain stores, whatever the profit is off that purchase is fleeing our community. In many ways, it'll never come back. Right? That is how you end up with one family, the Waltons. Anybody know who the Waltons is? Waltons are, yeah? Walmart. Walmart. I, think, I believe it's six of them. Six of them are the 10 richest Americans, are in the top 10 richest Americans in the country. Right? And they all live in uh, one community out in Arkansas? Yeah, Missouri. Yeah? M Missouri? Missouri and Colorado. Missouri and Colorado, yeah. So those places, those communities are doing well, I'm sure. So uh, what's our challenge? And I, I'm going to try to um, uh, do this as much as possible without the, the distraction of the PowerPoint. Let me talk about, from my own experience, what happens when uh, you give over a city to sprawl. And the environmental stuff should be pretty obvious. We'll talk about environmental and cultural and then economic sustainability and how that suffers. The environmental damage is pretty obvious, right? You take, I don't know if you notice this, if you read the paper a lot, you'll probably notice, uh, in Ithaca this is true anyway, that when these new sprawling suburban developments pop up, they are always named something nice like Strawberry Hill, right, or like Deer Meadow. Whatever they're named, that's what they're replacing. Right? right? So if you had a nice Strawberry Hill, it is now 40 row tracks of houses and duplexes, right? If you had a Deer Meadow Lane, good luck. The deer are gone. Uh, it's now a strip mall with a blockbuster. Do they have block? No, there's no more blockbuster. That's right. Thanks, Netflix. Uh, um, which is another, which is actually another point. Uh, uh, I believe that all over this country, we have too much commercial space. So it's kind of a weird thing to, to say, but blockbuster, borders, right? Kmart, all these places where anything that you can buy, particularly uh, anything you can buy online and have delivered to your door, you're going to have a very tough time competing in a bricks and mortar shop. Right? So I believe we actually overbuilt our commercial space and we're going to see, uh, we're going to have to repurpose a lot of the space. I mean, we see in Ithaca, uh, can, you, can you order groceries online here yet? Mm -hmm. Order groceries online? I see people order their toilet paper online, mm -hmm. which is either some terrific forethought or somebody who's very patient, trapped in their bathroom, <laughs> waiting like for a two-day overnight. Uh, where, where was I? Oh, the environmental. <laughs> env uh, environmental sustainability, you have to forgive me. Um, the environmental sustainability to the roads, right? right? The cars, the idling trucks the rush hour traffic, right? All of that contributes to uh, carbon emissions. And, and the paving, you know, paving a, a road is, I mean, it's a petroleum project, right? That, that we're using to put down this asphalt. So uh, allowing the sprawling to continue hurts us environmentally in ways that I hope are obvious. Culturally, uh, we need to build cities that are culturally sustainable. That is to say, cities in which the culture won't rip them apart. Now, we saw this happen in, we've seen it happen actually throughout the history of our country for different reasons, right? reasons of race and class. You can think of the riots in Watts or uh, Detroit, LA. You can go on and on. But you can think too, and I think this is an important, um, Trayvon Martin. Anybody remember Trayvon Martin? Been a little while since you heard the name, right? I'll remind you, this is, the, this is the young man who's 15 years old, who was shot and killed uh, by uh, George Zimmerman when he was walking uh, to his girlfriend's house. And remember, all he had on him was a pack of Skittles and a Snapple. And George Zimmerman said that he looked suspicious, so he started following him, called the police, confronted him. It was a confrontation, and, and Trayvon ended up uh, shot and killed. Now, I, without passing judgment on the incident itself, I will point out that the neighborhood in which this took place right, was a gated community with a literal gate, right? suburban, where everybody had their own front yard and side yard and, and driveway. Right? The kind of place in which uh, no sidewalks, right? 
So the kind of place in which a young black male walking might have looked suspicious. In fact, anybody that you didn't know walking down the street might have looked suspicious. Now, compare that to a city like San Francisco or New York City or right here in New Orleans. Could you imagine if every young black male that walked past you, you started following them? You never get to work on time, right? <laughs> you never make it there, right? So people don't look like suspicious. They look like they are part of your city. They become part of your life. And when we allow ourselves to become segregated, whether it's by race or by class, or, or I believe by religious differences, when we allow ourselves to be physically separated, that will manifest itself in a cultural and relationship separation. Right? What too comes from, from uh, a, a cultural integration that, that smart growth can bring, a cultural sustainability, is a rise in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, people getting together, uh, the, the guy who's a custodian, who has a great new idea for a mop. If he only ever interacts with other custodians, if he only ever interacts even with the other folks like him who have a minimum wage paying job, so who live in this community, what's a living uh, minimum wage paying community, he may never run into the entrepreneur uh, that he needs to meet or the financer that he needs to meet, the attorney he needs to run into at the grocery store we can say, hey, I've got this uh, new idea for a mop. Oh, that does sound interesting. Here, uh, let me give you a call so we can flesh that out. That kind of thing never happens in a city, in a neighborhood that's segregated. It's only in places in which people are living amongst each other, with each other, that we can have that success. Which leads me into the uh, uh, issue of economic sustainability. Right. A sustainable economy, which can be said a, a different way. Is anybody familiar with the term resiliency? Yeah. An economy that is resilient is an economy that can withstand the shocks that come from forces outside of the control of the city. Now, if you believe, like I believe, that global warming is real and is really a threat, and if you believe, like I believe, that uh, in a matter of decades, this is going to turn the world economy on its head, that buying your food from across the country or across the world is no longer going to be economically sustainable, right? or if you believe that buying your products from around the world, or shipping what it is you produce around the world is no longer going to be an affordable thing to do, then we have to start to work now on economies in which we can withstand any of those shocks. Right? May they be rising gas prices or, or natural disasters or uh, the tanking of the stock market because the housing industry or any other industry is over leveraged. Right? So how do we do that? And how does smart growth help us do that? Well, I, I believe that, um, let's take a look at what sprawl has done. I believe that sprawl has created spirals of, of poverty. And I believe it because I've seen it with my own eyes. I saw it in my own life. We lived, this is sort of an urban renewal thing. Um, we lived in a housing project. You know, subsidized housing, affordable housing. For decades, all the rage was, and the conviction was, that if you make these projects, the problem with these projects, the policymakers would go into them and they'd say, oh, no wonder these projects are full of poverty, and the, the poverty will last from generation, passing it down. The people who live here are living in dirty conditions, right? and the buildings are old. Here's how we'll fix it. We'll make the buildings new, and we'll make them clean. All of a sudden, folks can now climb out of poverty. I'll tell you, I lived in the cleanest housing project. It was sparkling. Uh, it was new. It smelled new. You smelled like new, fresh paint. But uh, it was uh, two miles from the grocery store. And what's more, there was no sidewalk that connected us to it. So we were the family that, have you seen this? Pushing the shopping cart. We'd walk two miles to the grocery store buy what we could afford, push the shopping cart back. Now let me tell you something. After a four-hour trip to get groceries, in which not only is it physically difficult, um, but um, emotionally discouraging and dispiriting, uh, you, don't, you don't get home and think about doing your homework. You, know, you don't get home and say, okay, I'm going to go out and get that second job. You don't get home and start to work on your night classes. Right? You don't seize the opportunities that you need to seize if you and your family are going to climb out of the hole that you're in. 
What's more is that if you live in a great, great, clean, new housing project that's been built off of the transportation lines, the subway, the buses, right, down a new road, right, that again you have to walk to, you can't stay after school, right, because the buses can't get you home. You've got to go home on the regular bus, right? Your parents don't have a vehicle and can't come get you. Even if they do have a vehicle, they've got to stay late at work uh, uh, just, just to make ends meet. What's more is that, that great new job, that after-school job, that you need not just to get some money in your pocket, but so that you can learn employment skills and you can put it on your college resume, you can't do because you are trapped. You are trapped, even if it's new and even if it's clean, you can become trapped in these housing projects. And that's what happens to, to far too many people. And these communities begin to spiral downwards. What makes it worse is that we've allowed, and in some cases even encouraged, what used to be called white flight, or white flight, particularly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, white folks moving out of the core of our cities and into the suburbs. Now is happening, it's, it's, it's no longer racial, it's all class-based. We now have class flight in our cities. Black folks moving out uh, when they can afford it, right? Uh, Asian folks mo moving out when they can afford it. We've allowed this and we've encouraged it because we've allowed the development of these nice, attractive sub suburban places. And what happens is when any time, and in some cases we've encouraged it because we think Fine, go ahead to, 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 uh, to us, it's the heights. So every city, I feel like, has a heights, you know? Do you guys have a heights here? No? What's your wealthy neighborhood? You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. Okay, tell me. I'll hold it. Oh. <laughs> is that why the room got quiet? Okay. So what happens, though, is uh, uh, whenever you allow that to happen, what happens is those folks no longer are spending their money inside the city. This is particularly true if they move across boundaries into a different jurisdiction. Not only are they spending their money at businesses outside of the city, no longer helping the folks in the middle class or the working class, uh, but their tax dollars no longer go to the schools right, that are in the inner city. Now those schools in the inner city are trying to recruit teachers and pay them and maintain uh, their schools and their school programs by taxing only the people who are left, which are the middle class and the working class. That means the taxes go up on the people who can least afford them. That means those folks are extra motivated to move out. As soon as they can afford to move out, they move out, leaving only the poorer folks behind, and it continues to spiral downwards. The poorer folks are left with schools that are underperforming. Uh, and because the schools are underperforming, the kids underperform. And they pass along to the families that come after them, the generations after them, this poverty. Right? Now, we can stop this and we can reverse it through smart growth by not allowing our wealthy folks to flee our city and by not pushing uh, the poor folks to the edges of our cities, uh, away from the cores of transportation and away from transportation amenities, away from the opportunities by, by encouraging and allowing for smart growth. And by doing that, we can do, uh, move into spirals of success. I'm going to, I'm, I'm talking quite a bit and I wanna have an opportunity to answer some, some Q&A. So I'm going to, to get to right, uh, right to what we're doing to try to stop these, these spirals of poverty and encourage cycles of success. Uh, <laughs> and we're doing four main things. One is a tax incentive. We've just reformed, we've always had a tax abatement program where we encourage folks to develop in our downtown. Uh, but we had a tax uh, program in which we had to complete 16 out of 40 check marks if you were a developer. And then they included everything from, from a lead certified building to a bike rack, right, installed in your building. If you did these, you would not have to pay the full amount of your taxes for a period of seven years. The problem was, every one of those check boxes was weighted equally. So you got one check if you put a bike rack in, and you got one check if you made your building lead platinum, right, it's madness. What else was a problem was that the, the city council had to approve these. So somebody would come and they'd work for months to make sure they checked 16 boxes, they'd bring it to the city council, and every member on the city council, and I was one of them and I played this game, would take a look at it and say, you did check 16 boxes, but you know, number 19 and number 22 are my favorite and you didn't check those, you know, I, really want a, I really want a bike rack, so we're gonna have to send you back, right? It was madness, and, and in five years, we had only had one project go through. So I've now reformed the system. It's now uh, four, <coughs> four boxes. You have to check all four. They have to be in the city. They have to be an investment of over half a million dollars. Right? Uh, they have to be dense. 
right? Or they could be, this is the fourth one, or they could be a remediation. They don't have to be any one of those three if they're a remediation of a brownfield site, a contaminated site. What's more, if you check these, you automatically are considered for the incentive. You, you no longer have to go through the common council process. So that's what we did with the tax payment. The second is we are completing a comprehensive plan so that this year we can begin the work of completely overhauling our zoning code. Uh, overhauling it to, again, make development um, easier while at the same time making it more attractive. And this goes to the, the fears that a lot of folks have about density. What's the, the problem with our current zoning code, like so many zoning codes, is that we used a Euclidean-based form of zoning. And this basically means it's geometric. Right? We tell you the shape or the, the size that it can be, but not the shape. And we tell you the use that it can be. Right? And when we tell you the use, that means we zone this area for residential and we zone this area for commercial. Right? But you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with uh, a grocery store in the center of a residential neighborhood? Or a movie theater? What's wrong with uh, being able to walk down from your building instead of getting in your car to go out to the store? What's, being, what's wrong with being able to walk to the corner and buy a loaf of bread and buy some milk and buy some cheese? These are the things we need to do. So we're going to move away from a use-based zoning and go to a form-based zoning, where instead of just uh, telling you that we can, you can build here um, 30 feet high and 100 feet wide, do you know what people do? This is how Walmart was born. You build a rectangle that's 30 feet tall and 100 feet wide. Right? And in that way, you can get the most possible square footage. But what if instead we tell you, based on the existing uh, architectural characteristics of the neighborhoods that we love in our city, more what your building's going to look like and less what you can do with it. Then we can allow developers to go about the business of developing without having to worry about getting approvals through our design board and our planning board, but instead knowing that they're going to build attractive buildings, the development process happens faster, and people can do more innovative work with what's happening inside the building. Next is the commons reconstruction. I mentioned this briefly. <laughs> I mentioned that uh, uh, we brought Senator Gillibrand. So the commons were meant to combat the malls. Successful for a while. But it's 40 years old, and it's crumbling, and it's falling apart. A lot of folks are saying, we should put a street back through it. Put a street back through it and put parking. That'll bring people back down to the downtown. But I'll tell you that the street alone is not going to do it, because this is just not how people work. Once you get into your car, particularly if you live in the suburb, right, you have a choice to make. Are you going to go to the mall, where you can park right in front of the mall, right? Parking is free. It's always available. You walk into the air-conditioned uh, or heated uh, stores. Uh, you walk right out, your car's back there. Or are you going to drive into the heart of downtown, going through the stoplights, going through the traffic, finding a parking garage in which you have to go all the way up to the top floor, take the elevator all the way down, cross the street in the rain or the heat or the cold, to go to the mom and pop store with a pair of jeans you were going to buy is a little bit more expensive, only to walk back out across the commons, across the street, up the parking garage, down the parking garage. Now you've got to pay for parking, and then you have to find your way out of the downtown core. It's not going to happen. Right? And even if we have a street that goes through the middle of our city. But if you live on the commons, right, and your choice is, am I going to walk down, downstairs and go four buildings over to buy that pair of jeans, or am I going to play the game where I go across the street, up the parking garage, down the parking garage, pay to get out, just so I can get to the mall and save 10 bucks on the pair of jeans? I don't think so. I'll spend a little bit more on the local business. I'll support the local business, even if it's a little bit more expensive because it's convenient to me. Those are the kinds of decisions we need people to make, and they weren't making it because our commons was uh, falling apart. Uh, so this is what the commons looks like now. We were able to because folks began to believe in our government. We had applied for a federal uh, grant four years in a row to upgrade the commons. Four years in a row we had lost, hadn't gotten it. Cities like New York City, uh, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Right? Kept winning these. So I eventually, <laughs> I called the program and I asked him, what do those cities have that Ithaca doesn't? And he said, uh, a million or more people. And I said, okay, what else? And he said, we get, he said, frankly, frankly, when these folks apply, we get hundreds of letters from residents. We get their senators knocking on our doors. We get them telling us that it's important. That's how we make these decisions. So I said, fine, that I can do. We delivered hundreds of letters from ordinary residents to community uh, business owners, to the faith-based community, folks in our churches. 
We got our senators to come down and visit the commons so they could see it for themselves and advocate for us in Washington, D.C. And we won an award the size, uh, four and a half million, the size of which we had never seen in the city for anything. Right? And that was only the beginning. Since then, we've gotten $16 million more for a whole series of other trans <coughs> transportation and infrastructure upgrades. So if you come and visit the commons, and I hope you do, if anybody hasn't been to, how, how many people have been to Ithaca? Oh, it's pretty good. How many people, so you've been on the commons? Nice, very nice. Uh, the next time you visit, we're gonna start construction this winter, this February. This is what you'll see. Uh, not only is it going to be new, but it's going to be improved with, with uh, durable paving surfaces, more uh, porous surfaces that allow rainwater through, rainwater catchment areas that we can then use to cycle back through and feed our trees, uh, solar panels that'll keep our lights going, and uh, uh, we think um, a design is going to get us through the next 50, 60, 70 years of our downtown core. Right. Included in this project are transportation improvements. This is the other important part. We have to make it easier to get around without your car because uh, as we fill up more of our space with people places and less with parking spaces, we have to give you alternatives to using your vehicle to get around. So uh, for the first time in 15 years, we've built sidewalks in the city of Ithaca and places where they weren't before. We've built more bike lanes in the first year, more stretches of bike lanes in our first year uh, than had been done in the entire previous eight years. And we've now just approved a bike boulevard plan that's going to create an entire network of bicycle priority streets. These aren't just bike lanes squeezed into the middle of streets, but this is, we're talking about heavy traffic calming on an entire night network so that bikes can go down the middle of our roads. And cars are welcome too, but they're gonna have to go around 15 miles an hour, right? What's cool and what's especially cool, it's part of the Commons project, we are going to uh, do a complete upgrade to our, to our, our, our bus system. Uh, you guys have the, the, the rail here, right? Streetcar. <laughs> Has anybody ever lived in a city where, with both a bus and a subway? Right there? What, what do you prefer to take? Subway. Subway, fast. <laughs> fast. Why is that? Do you, do you know why? No traffic. No traffic. So it goes faster. It just goes. What's more, too, there's an important psychological thing that happens on a subway that doesn't quite always happen on a bus. When you are waiting for the subway, you're sure you're in the right place. You know why? Because the rail is right there, right? The rail is right there. You're like, oh, that's right. Sometimes when you're waiting for the bus, you feel like maybe you're just a jerk standing on a sidewalk, <laughs> right? You're just like, am I in the right? Did, it, did I miss it already? Where the subway, they're announcing it. It sounds like this, but they're still, you know, they're announcing that it's coming. We are going to try to replicate without doing rail, which is extremely expensive, somewhere in the tune of, of 50 to 100 million dollars per mile, right, in the Northeast. We're going to replicate the things about rail uh, that make it attractive in our bus system. So it's faster because there's no traffic. It only stops when it's picking up or putting down people, right? What if you could put signal switchers on buses, buses that communicated to the red lights up ahead? that it was on its way, and those signals switched automatically to green lights. So the bus sailed right on through. Now the bus is only stopping, what, when it's picking up or putting down folks. These things are real. We're gonna buy them. We're gonna add them to our buses. Tried to buy one for my bike. They said no, they said, no go, but that's, that's fine. <laughs> what else we're gonna do? We're going to add, add uh, we're going to vastly improve our technology so that we can communicate to people <laughs> that one, the bus is on its way, and two, they're in the right place by adding monitors, screens, right? Booths where people can wait. So not only do they feel like, yes, I'm in the right place, but instead of wondering, did I miss the bus, they can look right at the screen uh, that's connected to a GPS that's already in our buses that says the number 30 bus that you're waiting for is on its way and will be to you in four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, and then you see it right there at your door. Those are the things we're trying to do. Transportation improvements, improvements to our downtown core, changes to our zoning, and changes to our tax incentives to get people back into the, the, the heart of our city, to make it more livable, make it more sustainable, environmentally, culturally, and economically. Uh, it's a heavy lift, and I've been hard at work at it. And this is where I work. Thank you. <laughs>